Hello everyone, I'm here today with Tracy, who is an amazing dietitian and an RDN. And the reason why I brought her on was because I'm always fascinated with people who have struggled with autoimmune conditions themselves. And Tracy had Hashimoto's and SIBO, and she was able to heal herself naturally. And now she's helping her clients do the same thing. And I'm a big advocate of healing naturally from autoimmune conditions. So now you have two people here helping you heal naturally. And um, welcome, Tracy. I would love for you to share your story with us. Yeah, thank you so much, Sona. I'm glad to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me on. Um, so basically, I had never heard of Hashimoto's. Um, in fact, the first time I heard of it, I was like, what is that? I just had no idea, even as a dietitian um, early in my career, what that was. And so about five or six years ago, um, I developed some abdominal pain. And it was just like a persistent aching pain that wouldn't go away. And I went to my Western doctor, my normal primary care provider, to get a workup and left with the diagnosis of IBS, which basically meant she didn't know what was going on, but she couldn't find anything seriously wrong. So that wasn't quite satisfactory for me. I wanted an answer. I didn't want to live in pain. So I actually sought out the care of a naturopath um, who takes a more holistic, natural approach to healing. And I had never worked with a naturopath before. But I figured, if I'm going to figure this out, I'm going to have to try something new. So I went to this naturopath, and it was like she was reading my mind, asking me about my symptoms. Do you have this symptom? Do you have that symptom? It's like, yes, yes. How did you know that? <laughs> and she diagnosed me with Hashimoto's and with SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And all of a sudden, all of these symptoms that I had, fatigue, brain fog, um, digestive issues, um, my period was gone, all of these different symptoms all came into place and made sense together with that diagnosis of SIBO and Hashimoto's. And so that kind of launched me into years of learning about natural and holistic healing and basically experimenting on myself, learning how to heal autoimmune disease and digestive disorders naturally with you know, other interventions, supplements, medications if needed, but primarily with a diet and lifestyle approach. And that has created the career that I have today, which um, it, I help my clients do just that, any kind of autoimmune disease, but specifically Hashimoto's and um, all kinds of food sensitivities and digestive issues. That's incredible. And I, I think, you know, with me, I, I had the similar approach where I did a lot of experimenting and learning about my body and learning about what my body resonated with. I worked with a lot of different doctors like a rheumatologist, endocrinologist, naturopathic doctor, functional medicine doctor. And, you know, um, the doctor can only know so much about your body. And mm -hmm. That's where I kind of had to come in and take the driver's seat because at the end of the day, they have a lot of different patients and you're only one of the many patients they deal with. And they kind of just go by what they know from their books and their studies and conferences they attend. And, um, you know, in, on my journey, I attended a lot of these health conferences just so I could learn Mm -hmm. about um, you know what they teach there and it's very much textbook oriented and there are very little answers when it comes to um, anything dealing with autoimmune conditions so uh, it's uh, very complicated in terms of that and I know with a lot of doctors you and I both have seen conventional doctors and they both look at the TSH and mm -hmm. then they come up with the diagnosis of you know uh, whether you have thyroid issues or not why do you think they don't look at anything else and just kind of mark someone as normal and done <laughs> yeah it's such a great question because you're right TSH is the standard number that every doctor will run as part of your annual physical and what a lot of doctors maybe they're starting to understand now I, I have seen a change in conventional medicine in this but um, for a long time, the, the normal range for TSH was anywhere from 0.5 up to 5, 
maybe even 10 at some labs, which is laughable to me because the optimal range, what we see in functional medicine and what I use as a, a range that I'm shooting for with my clients is 0 0.5 to 2. And if you are at a TSH of two versus a TSH of five or even seven, those feel completely, completely different because TSH is your body's demand for thyroid hormone. And the higher it is, the louder your body is saying, I need help. I need more thyroid hormone. So at those really high numbers, you're going to feel fatigue. You're going to feel symptomatic. But a lot of doctors only look at TSH because their only tool, their only treatment is medication. So to them, it doesn't really matter what your T3 is, what your T4 is, what your reverse T3 is, and especially not what your antibodies are, because they don't have a tool to address those things. They only know how to manipulate that thyroid number, that TSH. And, and also the TGAB antibodies, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, those kind of tell you whether you have long-term Hashimoto's or is it just short-term? Um, you know, a lot of these women I work with, they think if they lower their antibodies, everything's going to be okay and functioning. And um, I, I didn't, like with my experience, I don't think that's been the case because these antibodies can move from one organ that's stressed to another organ in your body and start attacking that. So you have to kind of take that whole body approach, which is why I wanted to bring you on. And I love that approach because if you don't take that approach, you know, you could live with autoimmune conditions your whole life, right? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And that I think is the crucial difference that um, Western medicine, most conventional doctors treat that TSH to a number, whereas with a functional approach, we are looking at the root cause, asking why is the body attacking itself in the first place? Because you're right, if that root cause is not addressed, then even if we get that thyroid to target, that autoimmune process can switch to another organ. Um, there are a bunch of different autoimmune diseases out there and they all have those common they all share some common roots autoimmunity in general and so it's so important to address that so that you can truly live a full and healthy life exactly and i think you know with autoimmune conditions and them like the antibodies going from one organ to another a lot of these women you know they face a challenge when they when it comes to just healing that it's like they tried food they tried having the clean diet and um it's not working they're working out um they're doing all these things and following protocols to a fault and not seeing results do you see that a lot with your clients i do um because i think there are some key things that get left out of the picture i think stress is really underestimated um, the impact that stress can have on our bodies, on our health, and specifically on our thyroid. Um, lifestyle, uh, so you mentioned diet, you mentioned exercise, you mentioned protocols, but lifestyle, are we doing things that we enjoy? Um, you know, is our life fulfilling? That's, that's an important thing. Mindset is super, super important. Um, just really trusting that our bodies can heal and knowing that they're capable of that. Um, digging for hidden root causes like heavy metals or mold toxicity or viruses, those things, if not addressed, you can be eating a perfect diet and you can be exercising. You can even be managing your stress, but if you haven't addressed those root cause triggers, then you're not going to experience full healing. Yeah, that's so interesting because with my sort of diagnosis, I it took me four autoimmune conditions to understand that you know, my genetics played a bigger role than I thought it did. And um, growing up, you know, I saw that my dad had a lot of skin problems, like a lot of um, hypopigmentation sort of issues. And mm -hmm. you know, my mom, she had uh, something called psychosis, which is a mental sort of issue. And um, you know, and then as I grew older, I'm like, okay, maybe I need to look into my genetics and. I found out why I was like, I had all these markers for oxidative stress, for inflammation, 
you know, and um, they were definitely turned on. And to turn them off, you have to have the right supplements to be able to get in the right pathways of your body and have them work, right? Yeah, there's a lot of tools out there. And I know for myself, when I first started, it felt really overwhelming to try and figure out what do I do? Where do I spend my money? What's worth investing in? How do I know if this is going to work for me? And part of it is trial and error. And part of it is having like a resource to turn to as well. Right. And then, um, so I have a question here for you from another woman. And she says, I have tried to tell doctors that I can physically feel myself flip from hypo to hyper, vice versa even with no medication change. Do you think this is possible? I have not had a stable TSH for over three years. Yes, this is such a good question because I can relate to this. When I was in the beginning of my journey, I was looking at two charts, one for hypothyroidism and one for hyperthyroidism. And I had symptoms on both. And I was really confused because I didn't understand the process of Hashimoto's in the beginning. But what happens is as the body is attacking that thyroid gland, it's breaking down that tissue. And over time, thyroid hormone gets dumped out of the thyroid and into the body. And that's what creates these hyperthyroid situations. So that phenomenon is called a swinging thyroid, where you swing from hyper to hypo to hyper to hypo. And eventually, the attack on the thyroid will be so extensive that there will no longer be thyroid hormone left to dump into the body and you kind of settle out at hypothyroidism. But that swinging back and forth is certainly part of, can be part of um, that process. And I think the important thing to know is that as you address that autoimmune attack, if you can stop the attack on the thyroid, then that does tend to resolve a lot of that swinging thyroid symptoms. Absolutely, bringing your body back into balance makes Mm -hmm. a huge difference. (laughs) So much difference, yes. So the next question I have is, um, I have a low thyroid since 2017, and um, I've been on synthetic T4, and it's always, the labs always showed normal. Um, In November, I started having heart palpitations, anxiety, sweating, tremors, shaking, pounding, racing heart. (laughs) Wow, that's a lot of symptoms. It is. And um, none of these symptoms have changed despite the uh, medication. And um, I was also put on T3. um, And I haven't seen any of these symptoms change. And my antibodies aren't different either. What is going on? Yeah, so it's a great question. There's a couple of things that come to my mind here. First of all, that autoimmunity can take time to develop. So this person mentioned that um, she had always had normal and stable labs. And then just in November, she developed all of these symptoms, heart palpitations, anxiety, sweating, tremors, racing heart. I mean, that's that's scary stuff. Um, And that can happen when that attack on the thyroid becomes so progressive, it it does lead to that tissue damage and we start to see these symptoms manifest. Um, To address the lab component, I'm not sure which labs um, are being referred to here, if it is TSH, T3, T4, or if it's the antibodies that haven't changed. But um, what I would say is that, let's just look at the antibodies in particular if those antibodies haven't changed despite the medication change, what that points to is a need to dig for the root cause. So kind of going back to the beginning, what we talked about a little bit ago, we can use medication to treat our TSH and get our thyroid numbers to a particular target, but the antibodies are the marker of autoimmune process in the body. And those are going to stay elevated as long as there is a trigger that is continuing to cause them to be elevated. So um, that means digging into, could it be gut infections? Could it be stress? Could it be nutrient deficiencies? Mm -hmm. All of those things um, contributing to that. And what's so insane about this is that, you know, I took um, Armour Throid and my symptoms amplified. Like Mm. I started getting hair loss. I was gaining weight. 
I started feeling very tired and I told my doctor and he was like, oh, you know, sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. <laughs> now, and I was like, no, you're not supposed to be losing hair. That's just straight unhealthy. Right. <laughs> and so I took myself off of that. And then a month later, I'm like, all right, I'll just try nutrient therapy. And then that wasn't, you know, I think the effects of that armor throid just carried on. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, he put me on Tyrosin, um, and mm -hmm. also, uh, LDN. Yeah. And the LDN would decrease my antibodies. It's actually, it increased them. Hmm. Um, um, it was like 180 to, then it jumped to like 370. Wow. So, um, I stopped taking all of it and I, it, it just so happened that I was at a muscle testing place. And they told me um, my adrenals were the issue. So, you know, when I started fixing my adrenals, um, my thyroid numbers jumped back to normal. Yeah, isn't that amazing? I mean, you touched on two really important things here, and that is that different medications work in different ways, and they affect different people differently. So if you're not feeling good on your medication, it's important to bring that back to your doctor and consider a different type of medication. And that's where knowing those numbers, T3 and T4, and not just your TSH can be really valuable because if you need more T3, maybe you want to consider supplementing with a T3 medication and not a T4 medication. So I'm, I'm such a fan of understanding the different types of medications and having that dialogue with your doctor about which one would be best for you. And then the other thing that you said that was so interesting is um, that you addressed your adrenals and your thyroid came back into balance. And that is really where that stress component ties in for a lot of people. If our adrenals are overly taxed, which can happen for a variety of reasons, but let's just say it's stress. That can be a stressor, you know, like I feel so stressed about work, or it can be an internal stress, like an infection or poor sleep or living in a bad environment, things like that. That affects our adrenals and our adrenals and our thyroid kind of play this balancing game. So if your adrenals are really struggling, it's going to pull your thyroid down as well um, and really challenge your thyroid health and vice versa. If your thyroid health is not good, then it's going to challenge your adrenal health. That's so true. And, um, you know, with the adrenals, it, I found out that like my previous conditions, autoimmune conditions, they totally like it's when the adrenals are taxed is when your whole body kind of just goes out of balance. and it's that fight or flight response. And so I found out that, you know, my adrenals were really taxed after three conditions and never had any supplementation or anything like that. Um, and it was like my TSH was at a 6.4 and it jumped back to 2.4 in two weeks. Oh my gosh. Wow. That's like night and day difference. Right. Uh, and I was literally on the couch at 6.4. Yeah. <laughs> I believe that. I definitely do. But um, yeah. And with the, uh, you know, adrenals, it wasn't, it, it didn't really affect my antibodies. So um, with that, I found out that it was like, you know, if you have viruses and infections, like I had HHV6 and which is in the EBV family um, and different viruses that were not only in my blood and gut, but they were in my cells. And mm -hmm. to kill viruses on a cellular level is what I had to figure out because mm -hmm. it was um, basically killing my body from the inside. <laughs> Yes. And that's something that conventional doctors are, they don't talk about that. They don't even know that. And that's where it really, like you really do have to be your own advocate when it comes to taking a natural approach to healing. You have to stand up for the fact that you don't feel your best and you want to feel better and you're going to figure out how to do it. Yeah. And so you ask questions and you do research and you bring information to your doctor and it is, it's a very, it can be a very challenging, but a very empowering process. So with your healing process, was it mostly diet and um, lifestyle changes that sort of brought things back into balance again? So I, I had to treat the SIBO first. Um, and then I had, I mean, probably three or four years of restoring my gut after that treatment. It was pretty intense. 
Um, I had gut issues before that, but the antibiotics, um, multiple rounds of different antibiotics that my doctor had put me on, I would not do that approach again. I would do it differently. But um, treating the SIBO, then healing my gut through diet and supplementation, um, but also treating underlying viruses. Epstein-Barr was a, an underlying factor for me as well. So I treated that using IV, IV nutrition therapy, vitamin C and hydrogen peroxide IVs, which were very effective in helping me um, get that under control. And then working on just supporting my adrenals and optimizing my liver. Um, the other thing that I learned about myself is a couple of genetic SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. So the MTHFR mutation um, affects the way that my body methylates, which affects detoxification. Um, and then I also have a gene that affects my nitric oxide production, which affects circulation. So if your body is not circulating well, it's not oxygenating well, and then it's not healing very well. So a lot of, there were a lot of pieces to the puzzle. And it was like, every time I turned over a stone, I addressed that and I felt a little bit better. And then I turned over the next one and I addressed that and I felt a little bit better. So it was definitely a process. Absolutely. I, I was the same way. And I was like, oh, I, I thought I'm healed, you know, <laughs> the whole adrenal thing. But I'm like, wait, my gut is still not working. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, I actually, you know, it's interesting you mentioned the hydrogen peroxide IV with the vitamin C. Um, I actually tried the drops, you know, like the... Um, 35% food grade uh, mm -hmm. drops in water and I would have them three times a day and I worked up to like 26 drops uh -huh. but um, I think it's more effective through the bloodstream. <laughs> Definitely there's a huge difference in fact I saw a research article recently that compared vitamin C orally versus vitamin C intravenously and the vitamin C orally your body maxes out at absorption at a certain level and it could only i forget the specific numbers but the the blood level achieved of vitamin c was magnitudes lower than what you can achieve with even just a very small dose iv so it was interesting to me to see how powerful they really can be wow and you did like years of this huh like i did i did <laughs> this is you know from the girl who would run from a needle growing up um i did iv therapy twice a week for um, a few months, and then once a week for a few months, and then um, twice a month for about another year. So wow. it was a lot. Um, and now I just use them as needed. You know, if I feel like I need a little boost or something coming on, I'll go get one. But it was, it was an investment uh -huh. of both time and money. Um, but it was instrumental in my healing, I would say, just because it addressed my specific root cause very effectively. Yeah, you know, I, I think hydrogen peroxide is amazing. A lot of people don't really consider it because they don't know about it in their healing. So yeah. Um, yeah. that's a great one. And then let's see, um, the next question I have here has to do with SIBO and eating clean, um, but the inflammation is horrible. It's so difficult. I have IBS, SIBO, leaky gut, testing, testing. I can never get the correct answers. How do I fix this? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it can feel overwhelming. And so what I usually recommend with my clients is I start everyone with a simple elimination diet. I have a lot of people who come to me and they want to do this test and that test and all of these expensive things. Um, and I usually say, let's just start with a, a basic elimination diet. It's usually something along the lines of like a paleo template um, that eliminates the most common triggers, grains, dairy, soy, corn, things like that. And my, my first goal is to see if we can find a lower symptom or an asymptomatic baseline, basically to just support quality of life. Um, I wanna get those symptoms under control as quickly as possible. So sometimes we're pulling more foods out until we can find something that is manageable. And then when we find that baseline, and sometimes we can't, but hopefully we do, um, that's when then we start to assess, okay, if we bring this food back in, what happens? How does that affect me? And that kind of starts to help me build a picture depending on 
the response and the symptoms helps me build a picture and understand what might be going on. Is it bacterial? Is it functional? Is it structural? Um, things like that. So that's when then I may decide to do stool testing or um, refer out for like a scan of some kind or use herbals or herbal anti antibacterials or antivirals, things like that. But usually it starts with an elimination diet. And then if that, you know, if we need to dig a little bit further, bringing in some of those other tests. I so agree with that. Um, you know, it's interesting because a lot of these doctors, including all the doctors I went to, were so keen about putting people on supplements. But, yeah. um, you know, what's the point of being on a supplement if your body can't absorb it and you have yeah. all this inflammation you have to get rid of these fires in your body before your body can focus on breaking down food or even the supplements you're taking. And um, that's one thing that I realize doctors don't do these days, which is kind of sad because a lot of people that come in with autoimmune conditions, it's really, it boils down to inflammation and understanding where this inflammation is and what's causing it and fixing that before you can do anything else um so yeah even for me like i had to completely like i knew in order to get rid of inflammation in my body i had to just give it my digestive tract a, a break so i did a lot of like fasting i did a lot of um like detox baths i did enemas and i kind of wanted to just start off with a clean slate yeah. and, <laughs> and then i also did the hydrogen peroxide which you know like in the oxygen it totally kills all the viruses and infections you have so yeah that was sort of um what i did and then i started doing the elimination diet because i felt like you know no matter what i put in my body i would be allergic to it if i didn't just clean out my body <laughs> yeah and that's a really important point that inflammation is the found it's one of the foundations of developing autoimmune disease because it's what contributes that leaky gut is what contributes to interrupting that gut barrier which is what allows things to get into the body and trigger that autoimmunity so you're right it is important to just quelch that fire put it out and address that inflammation um and we do that through diet lifestyle supplements things like that there's a, a quote that i use often that says something to the effect of you can be eating the most perfect pristine organic however you know bells and whistles diet, but if you're not digesting it, then it's not doing you any good. So exactly. super important. And the other thing that I, I wanted to mention here quickly is that I think something that's overlooked a lot is the value and um, the effectiveness of the way that we eat. So eating in a seated, calm, not stressed, not distracted manner can go a very long way. I can't tell you how many people come to me with a ton of gut issues, bloating and constipation and gas and pain, and they're running around and they're eating a bite here and then they're doing this and then they're eating a bite there and they're doing that. And the only thing we change is for them to sit down and chew their food well and half their symptoms go away just like that. It's so funny that you mentioned that because um, when I had my second autoimmune condition, I had uh, basically, I passed out in a gym and um, a personal trainer found me and took me to the ER. And that's how I found out I had a hemoglobin of 4.5, basically. Wow. Blood in my body. And um, I had to get blood transfusions. But, you know, I was working with this trainer because, like, she felt really bad that I went through this experience and she didn't know anything about autoimmune conditions. But, I was also the most impatient person ever and she would have me sit down and eat dinner with her and she would have me chew my food 40 times <laughs> every bite and I was like oh my gosh I cannot do this and it was like you know um we would just like stare at each other and yeah. eat food. <laughs> it does feel so strange when I tell people to like turn off the screens and just eat 
and to chew until, you know, until it's well chewed, put your fork down between bites. People are like, I'm so bored at meals. Like, what do I do? It just feels so strange, but it is, it's a really important practice. And, and it does get easier. It becomes more second nature to chew really well. But in the beginning, it can feel really weird. <laughs> now, how do you feel about a liquid diet? Because, like, you know, there are people that, like, they don't have the time to chew 40 times or... Yes. <laughs> it's true. It's true. So a liquid diet, I think, can be used as a short-term intervention. Um, and specifically here, I'm thinking of something called the GAPS diet. I'm sure you've come across that in all of your research, gut and psychology syndrome diet. Um, and it starts with a, a pureed diet. So when, I, when my symptoms were really significant, um, I did blend all of my food. And it did help because really what it's doing, that's breaking down, it's physically breaking down the food so that your body doesn't have to do that work. And it allows more opportunity to extract those nutrients. So I think as a short-term healing intervention, totally fine. As an, I don't want to take the time to chew my food, maybe not your best long-term strategy. <laughs> right. You know, maybe, you know, like, because the food also has some nutrients in the core. And I think like chewing it makes a, a difference as well. <laughs> and it, tur it turns on your digestion. Chewing turns on your digestion. So what I see a lot of times is for people who do smoothies a lot, for example, they just gulp it down and they're not activating that rest and digest mode. They're not chewing. So their, their body, their stomach is not prepared for that food. And it just hits their stomach and it ends up with, they end up with a lot of bloating because their body is not digesting that. Wow. Yeah. I, I mean, that's why I kind of, I mean, if I have a smoothie, I have something I eat with it. I, mm -hmm. I don't just drink something. I don't think I could do that. Diet. It's just not. <laughs> I know. I like chewing my food. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we've answered this question, but uh, what is normal TPO antibodies? what is considered high and um, can high TP, uh, can high antibodies cause fatigue, weight gain, loss of eyebrows, brain fog, and hair loss? Yes. So this is a great question because it kind of ties everything together here. So yes, all of those are really common symptoms of Hashimoto's. Fatigue, weight gain, loss of hair, eyebrows, eyelashes, brain fog, um, irregular periods, um, cold hands and feet, et cetera super common symptoms of Hashimoto's. And we know that someone has Hashimoto's when they have elevated antibodies, which is that TPO number. So TPO and TGAB are the two primary antibodies that we look at to diagnose Hashimoto's. So for TPO, we usually wanna see those less than 35. It depends on who you talk to um, and what lab in particular you're working with, but less than 35 is the number that I use. And it is possible to get those antibodies down by addressing the root cause. So some of the things that we kind of mentioned above, looking at, are you dealing with viruses? Are you dealing with too much stress? Um, are you eating, maybe you're severely allergic to dairy and you're eating dairy every day, or you know, maybe you have a gut infection or candida. Addressing and treating those root causes will alleviate that attack on your body and help to bring, allow those antibodies to come down because they're no longer needed. They're not, your body's not under attack anymore. Exactly. Um, and you know, a lot of people, I think we spoke about this a little bit, is that they believe that their antibodies um, can just be brought down like it's like, uh, for me, it was like a gradual process. You know, my mm -hmm. antibodies dropped from like 240 to like 180 and then 180 to like 160 and then you know it took like months for it to even drop down to 80 and then like it was like a gradual sort of uh, drop is that was that the same experience you had yes and i see that most commonly we'll see them come down in chunks 20 30 um my first the first time I, I measured three months after I was diagnosed um, with antibodies above a thousand, they had come down to like 700. And then the next time they had come down to 500 and then it was more gradual from there. So you can see big gaps, but for the most part, it does take a little bit of time to bring those antibodies down. Absolutely. Um, and you know, like, I, I don't know with my, even when my antibodies were like none, basically, I was still getting hair loss, but not like fatigue or 
you know, uh, some of the other symptoms and my weight kind of, you know, I, I've never had a weight issue because I always kept myself in check. Um, you know, like I, I tried not to be like insulin resistant or, you know, have like high blood sugar spikes or eat anything that would cause that. So, um, in terms of like that, I've never had those sort of crazy symptoms. I mean, I did gain 15 pounds on <laughs> armor thyroid, but like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an athlete, so they would just come down, like the, the weight would just come down when my diet was fixed. It, mm -hmm. it was a correction. Um, but I don't see that like, you know, um, there's a correlation between hair loss and antibodies. Is, do you see that or? So what I tend to see is that something like hair loss, there's a lot of nutrients involved there as well. And healing takes a lot of nutrients. So sometimes I see a delay with some symptoms um, coming back into balance for a few months after we've gotten antibodies down to goal. And that's because the body has stopped the autoimmune attack, but there may still be some healing that's going on and some restoring and repairing and replenishing of nutrients that were used up in the healing process. So yes, that's definitely, um, that's not uncommon. That's great. And then um, let's see, what's the next question? Is it really possible to go into remission from Hashi's permanently? And how do we do it? Well, you have two people here that <laughs> have been Hashimoto, so I would think it's possible. <laughs> yes, absolutely. What I always remind people is part of autoimmune disease is genetics. So we always have the genetics. We can't change our genetics, but we can change our lifestyle and we can take away our triggers and we can heal our gut. And those are the foundations that make up autoimmune disease. So if we knock those others out of the way and all we're left with is genetics, then our autoimmune disease is essentially in remission. And that's not to mean that it can't come back. We can deal with flares. I have dealt with Hashimoto's flares over the years. Um, symptoms coming back up triggered by maybe an illness or an infection or a move or stress or any of those things. But we have the tools to bring our body back into balance and to heal again. So yes, it is possible to go into Hashimoto's remission and to keep it that way. And really the way to do it is to do what we've been talking about, which is address those root causes and your diet and lifestyle um, and really take good care of yourself. Absolutely. And I, um, you know, it's like a lot of people say you can't heal from autoimmune conditions. And I, I think you can truly, I mean, once you have an autoimmune condition, yeah, your like immune system is compromised for the rest of your life, but you can control it. You can control how your lifestyle is, what you put in your body, how you treat yourself and you know, like, um, if you're eating pizza every night, I mean, that's kind of <laughs> like setting yourself up for, uh, you know, relapse. So I think, um, you know, there's a ways to avoid it. Like for me, I, I do a lot of like oxygen therapy. I do the, the hydrogen peroxide and that sort of helps me get that extra boost to, mm -hmm. um, that my immune system needs to be able to get things flowing again. And um, I think it's important that you understand the, the new lifestyle that comes with dealing with autoimmune conditions, because it's not just, um, it, it's your whole life is different. You know, after yeah. you have an autoimmune condition, you can never live like the average person lives. And this is something that you have to get through your head because you know there were so many times in my life where i wish i just had a normal functioning body <laughs> and i wish i just like could fit in the crowds of people who drank drank beer and ate pizza and you know lived a really like uh, social life and mm -hmm. um over the years i i got into knowing like did a lot of spirituality and learning about myself and i said you know it doesn't make me unique if i was like that um it doesn't a lot of those people may have these conditions and not even mm -hmm. know it you know mm -hmm. how 
how lucky are you to have found out you have this condition and you can do something about it and have it not get worse, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I can relate to that. There have definitely been times where I wish I could just go to the local food, you know, food truck or food stand and just like buy some food and not have to ask all of these questions about it. And there are certainly some inconveniences that come along with this new life. But at the same time, I'm so grateful because it has allowed me to understand my body and empower me and equip me to care for my health so much more effectively than I, I did in the past. I mean, I lived a very standard American life, very standard American diet. And Hashimoto's basically has given me this opportunity to care for myself and to teach others how to do that as well. And that's incredible. I mean, even in my family, I, I grew up, my dad was a pharmacist, my sister is a pharmacist, you know, my cousins are pharmacists. And <laughs> like, if I speak to them about genetics, they laugh at me, you know, mm -hmm. like, once I, I remember, I'm like, Dad, I think the mold in the house is causing my autoimmune condition. He's like, get out of here. Every place <laughs> in the world has mold. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a very different perspective <laughs> so uh yeah you know i called a person to get mold testing in the whole house and he was so upset because he's like you know every house has mold you cannot get rid of mold <laughs> <laughs> it's tough but mold is a major trigger for a lot of people it was one of my triggers as well yeah, like, you know, you read about it and this stuff, like, isn't made up. And I think that's where people kind of have to unlearn what they've learned from these conventional doctors and, mm -hmm. and people that have taught them things because they've only taught them things from a, a perspective that worked, I don't know, like, for them in the capitalism industry, right? <laughs> right, 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 exactly. And they, you said it earlier, but you know your body best. Exactly. And, you know, it's important to, to trust that. Exactly. So, um, yeah, and uh, let's see. I'm going to go into a couple more questions here because we're running out of time. Okay. Um, let's see. So what in, what is... Um, causes Hashimoto's and celiac could it be could it cause severe depression could Hashimoto's and celiac celiac cause severe depression that's what they're asking yes so it is possible um, I think one thing to keep in mind is that we know there's a very prominent connection there's a gut brain connection and celiac is autoimmune disease in the digestive system. And so that obviously affects the gut. And Hashimoto's, because thyroid hormone is used throughout the entire body, that also affects the gut. So depression is a common symptom of um, hypothyroidism in particular, which is the eventual result of unmanaged Hashimoto's disease. So I think we can ask ourselves, well, what do we do about this except you know, we, we know that we can use medications, we can use antidepressants, but a lot of people have concerns about those because of side effects or they don't want to be on them or whatever the case may be. So what I recommend is honestly a lot of the same principles that come into play. We want to heal the Hashimoto's. We want to take away the triggers that could be triggering the Hashimoto's or the celiac. And we do this by implementing an anti-inflammatory whole foods based diet. Maybe we use an elimination diet to figure out our specific triggers. We want to keep blood sugar stable, which keeps our adrenals happy along with stress management. Um, we want to work with our doctors to optimize our thyroid levels because um, hypothyroidism is associated with depression. Um, a couple of other things, just je like gentle movement and getting outside, getting in the sunshine, those simple, simple things can go a really long way. And then being a part of a community that is supportive. So for me, I found a lot of supportive people um, on Instagram and on Facebook in the beginning days of my journey where I didn't know anyone else in real life who was dealing with Hashimoto's and on a restricted diet and dealing with my symptoms. And I was able to find community online and that made a huge difference for me. Um, so community and then just embracing things that you love to do, like what brings joy to your life. And I think 
a lot of these things are underestimated, but they really can make a big difference there. You're so right. I mean, even for me, it's like when you live a totally different lifestyle that the average person doesn't live, you know, you kind of get made fun of you. Mm -hmm. You get laughed at and people it's because people don't understand you. But at the same time, you know, you're dealing with this disease, you're feeling these symptoms. And on top of that, you get laughed at. And it kind of just discourages you from wanting to even go out with your friends and make friends at that point. So, you know, for me, I was like, my whole life, I, I felt so alone and I felt so disconnected and I didn't know why. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, I'm a good person. Like I have a good heart. Like, why am I not feeling connected with people I hang out with? And it took me three conditions to understand that it was, you know, I have to connect with people who have autoimmune conditions because mm -hmm. they will understand me. They will understand my lifestyle, why I have to eat a certain way, why I have to get my sleep and yeah. box my body. And, you know, and it's, um, it's interesting because, um, you know, you try to hide your illness, you try to avoid it, but you can't. You know, it's like it, you're going to have to live with it and you're going to have to find the most creative way to be happy with this illness. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well said. Embrace. Um, there's another line that comes to mind that you can't heal a body that you hate. And I think it's important to, I think all of us, when we're diagnosed with something like Hashimoto's, we have a period of like frustration or why me or this again, or resistance, basically. And the sooner we work through that, I don't think we should ignore it, but I think the sooner we work through that and we come to a point of embracing um, this process, the easier the process becomes. Absolutely. You know, and it, it became a lot easier for me after I started meeting people who had not just Hashimoto's, but endometrius and mm -hmm. fibromyalgia and other conditions that you know I mean we all have different symptoms even with Hashimoto's you and I probably didn't have the same symptoms right <laughs> so um, it's uh, with all these different diseases out there it's important to create that community and have people you can rely on for information or even if you're having a bad day you know yeah. it's, uh, it's kind of like you shouldn't keep that to yourself. You should mm -hmm. definitely speak to someone. <laughs> Have your support network and use them. Exactly. So what are your uh, three biggest takeaways, Tracy? <laughs> I think the biggest, the biggest one, and this is a shift probably from what I would have said a few years ago, it's your mindset. Um, I mentioned this a couple of times, but just knowing that your body can heal and that your body wants the best for you and it's looking out for you. And the reason you have these symptoms is because it's fighting hard for you. That mindset shift can make a huge difference in the healing process and, and just how you feel about the journey. Um, I think the second takeaway is that healing is possible. I think a lot of times um, I have clients come to me or I hear from people online who are told you know, this is just the way that life is with Hashimoto's and it's just not true. There's so much healing to be had. You can feel better. You can, um, get back to living your life. You don't have to feel miserable all the time. Um, and then what would a third takeaway be? Um, I guess just, yeah, like the value of diet and lifestyle. Like there's so much more than just medication. And there's so much more than just food. All of these factors that we've talked about, finding your root cause, living in community, um, aligning with your purpose, moving your body, stress management, all of those things together are what create that optimal health and healing. I love that. Thank you so much for being on the show today and sharing all your wonderful insight. And I will make sure everyone has your information. So they can connect with you even after this. And um, if you have any questions or anything um, beyond this, please you know, just add them to the comments. Tracy, uh, where are you based? I'm in, I'm in Phoenix. Phoenix, oh, that's wonderful. That's where all the 
amazing H2O2 uh, facilities are. <laughs> yes, we do have a lot of really neat therapies here. It's, it's great. So people who live in Phoenix, do you recommend a place for uh, the H2O2 therapy? I actually have been going to um, SCNM, which is the Southwestern Naturopathic College of, or College of Natural Medicine. It, and you're, what's kind of cool is you're able to go see students there. And so it's cheaper if you're willing to see a student. Um, but they have an IV room. So I've gotten my IVs done there. That's incredible. It's mm -hmm. affordable. Otherwise, I remember mine were like $190 for 90 minutes. It's not cheap. <laughs> no, uh -uh. the um, hydrogen peroxides I think are like $90, $90 at SCNM. That's an incredible resource. So yeah. I think we should have a retreat in Phoenix sometime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, come on over. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. It was great to chat with you. Great.